This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. This week is episode 678, and we welcome Mark Ames, the AIHA Director of Government Relations, and we're going to go over the recent White House Summit on Indoor Air Quality, a big event for the indoor air quality world, the first time ever the White House has uh, kind of recognized this as a major issue. Uh, Mark was there, and we're going to catch up on that three-and-a-half-hour summit for you and kind of give you the highlights. So before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. They're the reason we can continue the show. And don't forget, after the show, you can go to afterthoughts.iaqradio.com for follow-up discussion sponsored by First On Site. Our marquee sponsor is First On Site at firstonsite.com. Our association sponsors are the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, ACGIH.org, the American Industrial Hygiene Association, AIHA.org, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute, CIRIScience.org, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification, IICRC.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories, AEMLINC.com, Particles Plus, ParticlesPlus.com, TSI Inc., TSI.com, Sunbelt Rentals, SunbeltRentals.com, April Air, April AIRE.com, Healthy Indoors Magazine, HealthyIndoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnick at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry to report that no one correctly identified Michael Faraday as the scientist whose contributions to the study of electromagnetism, including dimagnetism and electrolysis. The IQ Radio Trivia Question for today, October 14th, 2022, has been sponsored by TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for the monitoring of indoor air. Learn about how to expand your IAQ investigations at TSI.com. Here's today's IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Trivia question. Name the part of government relations that involves pleading or arguing in favor of something such as a cause, idea, policy, or active support. Back to you, Joe. All right. So since 2003, Mark Ames has led the government relations activities of major national and global nonprofit associations. He's represented educators, school leaders, engineers, and workplace and community health and safety professionals. He currently serves as the head of government relations for the American Industrial Hygiene Association. Welcome, Mark. Hey, good to see you, everyone. Thanks great so much for having me you. on. It's great to have you. I, you know, it seems like your background kind of was the perfect fit for the White House IAQ summit. You know, you've you've been with ASHRAE in the past. You're with AIHA now. You led a school group. I can't remember the exact name of it, but uh, kind of like it was your destiny to be there. <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, funny how a career comes together. Like, you know, in retrospect, you're like, oh yeah, it was like totally intentional. I always meant to do this exactly. But, you know, it's like you start off and you kind of fall into these things. Like way back in the day, I guess it all started when I was a wee intern at the National Education Association. And, uh, and so then uh, later on, I got uh, sort of my lobbying career. And I guess maybe I should even back up because it's fall and I feel like we should talk about beautiful places in fall. And I got to put a shout out for my hometown of Binghamton in Western New York, because this time of year, it's absolutely gorgeous. And well, Washington DC area is, is wonderful, especially during cherry blossom season. If you want to go to a place that's really beautiful, check out Western New York. And I'm sure the parts of Pennsylvania are probably 
similarly majestic, but to my old hometown, it was like carved out by glaciers and it's got these rolling hills. It's absolutely great uh, hiking. I'm sure that the colors are, are gorgeous. My folks are still up there. But that's kind of my, my story is that I come from a small town in Western New York, Binghamton. And then I got my start and then I've been in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> excuse me, since, uh, since 2003, doing work in various places. Started at the National Education Association, started lobbying at the National Association of Secondary School Principals, NASSP. And it was actually there beneath my desk. I had a little like corner desk. It was very modest. And underneath that desk, there was an accordion style binder of the EPA IEQ tools for schools program. And it was one of these things that maybe there is a little bit of fate mixed in there because within <laughs> that document, folks who have uh, had a chance to check it out, it references two of my future employers, EIHA oh. and ASHRAE. So uh, yeah, as, as you said, spent uh, my whole entire career, uh, my whole time in Washington DC, about 19 years now focusing on infrastructure issues, focusing on workforce development, focusing on, uh, on indoor environmental quality broadly. And, and so that included time, again, cut my teeth lobbying at the secondary school principals where I served on the board of directors, very young age, but it's a great experience. Definitely encourage you, I had an amazing boss. So this speaks to the value, uh, the importance of leadership and leadership development. I had a really supportive boss and so she encouraged me to do two things that were really transformative for me. One, she encouraged me and I did complete, uh, I became an education policy fellow. So that immersed me in the world of education policy and all the challenges that school leaders and the whole in industry and infrastructure that supports in the school environment is. And she also supported me in my uh, in my endeavor to get on the board of the Committee for Education Funding, which is one of the largest groups in the nation that focuses, of course, on education funding. So there, uh, so I did some uh, some work there, eventually got up at uh, a relatively young age to serve on their board of directors. And, and it was an actually really interesting thing. Uh, small world, especially in Washington, D.C., I was on the board during a period of transition and actually ended up in a position where I, where we ended up hiring someone who used to be my supervisor when I was an intern at the <laughs> National Education Association. So at any rate, uh, then over at ASHRAE, about seven years, and then uh, here, about six years at AIHA. Well, when, when this event came up, I'm wondering, you know, with all the experience you've had, what what did you think, what were your kind of notions going in? What was your perspective coming into the event? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I got the agenda beforehand, so I checked out the speaker list, and uh, I believe that that agenda is somewhere. It is public domain, so if it's not uh, on the uh, on the YouTube channel that we we can find a way or if it's not on the, the White House indoor air quality web page then we can find a way to make it available to folks uh, got it here uh, John's but, got it uh, up on the screen now oh uh, yeah wonderful there we are yeah so it's uh, so it gives you all kinds of uh, the first bit is like how to get to the Capitol and or the, the White House uh, in that a little more John there's the main agenda right here Yep. So, uh, so, so, you know, it kind of gives you an idea of what they wanted to focus on, but I was really interested to hear the perspectives of the various stakeholders and then hear uh, what is going to be next, because I've been around for a while now and I've seen these things. So you get a, you get something that's like high on the agenda and it's like flash in the pan. And then if you don't have sustained focus, then the momentum can be lost and you might not accomplish your goals. So that's why it's like understanding what your goals are, what the needs are, having a plan and then persistently pursuing that plan, like super, super important. So that's, so that, that's some of the thinking that I had going in really curious about the perspectives from folks and really curious about what the, the white house and the agencies are thinking of in terms of how to take this moment 
And as I think Tracy, Tracy Anger said, take this moment and turn it into a movement for improving IAQ. And they do seem to have a particular focus in schools, which, it, which makes sense. And I guess for, for everyone's edification, it may be also relevant to note that I currently serve on the board of directors for the Rebuild America's School Infrastructure Coalition, which is a nonpartisan coalition that's, um, that helps focus attention, of course, on improving school infrastructure. You know, um, what we were supposed to have Joe Allen on, who was one of the, he was the first speaker after, after Dr. Ja, um, and he's going to be back with us. He's going to get with us on November 18th. But when I saw this event and I saw your name, I was like, oh, that's perfect. Maybe if I'm lucky, I can get Mark to come on and give his thoughts. So what, what we've done is uh, we brought you in and we, we back actually cut some clips. And John, why don't we jump right to that first clip so people can get an idea of how this started out. I, I think what Mark and I are going to try and do is give you in this 45 minutes we have left here uh, about three hours worth of, of the conference and kind of our highlights. So let's start with that first one, John. Not a simple you. case, and there are lots of cases for it. And I'm going to tell it to you as a clinician. So I'm a hospitalist physician, and before I took on this job, uh, every winter, December, January, I would spend a month on the hospital wards as a hospitalist. And here's what I experienced every winter, pre-pandemic. The hospitals would be stretched, stretched to their limit during the holidays, would have patients waiting in the emergency room for days because there were no beds on the wards, largely due to influenza and other respiratory viruses. That was pre-pandemic. Right? And influenza is not going away, and we know COVID is not going away. And so as we look forward to this fall and winter, I think it is reasonable to assume that we are going to see this a level of influenza that we saw pre-pandemic. Throw in COVID on top of that, think about RSV and parainfluenza and all the other respiratory viruses, and it becomes harder and harder to imagine how our healthcare system is going to possibly manage the burden of respiratory diseases that are all around us. And so we could take two strategies. We could take strategy number one, where we go out and build thousands of more hospitals, train millions of doctors and nurses, and accept hundreds of thousands of more deaths every year. We could take that strategy. I would argue that's not the strategy we should be taking. We may need to do some work on thinking about our healthcare capacity. We have to bring the burden of respiratory pathogens down. And the single biggest structural change that we can make as a society is to do for indoor air what we've done for water quality. And that's why this administration has made improving indoor air quality a key priority. Whether it's in schools or businesses or other public places, and as I have said publicly many, many times, if you are somebody who runs a building, operates a building, it is incumbent on you to make sure that the place you run, the place you own, does not become a place that unnecessarily spreads viruses gets people sick, fills up our hospitals, causes unnecessary suffering and death. We need healthy buildings because we need healthy communities. And that brings us to this summit. So the purpose of this summit isn't just to highlight these issues, though we want to do that. Um, the purpose is to highlight the work we are doing in the administration and the work that so many of you are doing outside the administration. Right? We want to showcase schools that have made improving safety a major priority. We want to showcase businesses that have made investments in their employees and their customers. To remind people that the benefits of these improvements have to be felt and seen for it to be real. Mark, I thought that was a great way to start things off, but I yeah. wanted to get your thoughts. Yeah, I definitely agree. Dr. Ja, what, he is an inspiring person and I was seated at a table just off of to uh, stage left so uh, it was uh, he, he he's a he's a wonderful speaker and an inspiring speaker i guess that he said he did a great job of setting the table and helping us understand what we are all here to accomplish and then uh, joe allen the next speaker oh my gosh like i took a bunch of quotes for him and i was like so many great insights uh you know, I, I kind of wish that some of those leaders uh, uh, stayed at the, the event the whole time, but you can imagine they've got a lot of ground to cover. You know, the clock is ticking for them. There's a lot of pressure. 
So that's one of the dynamics I always keep in mind is what are the motivations, what are the pressures that policymakers of all types at all levels of government, the stakeholders everywhere are facing, what are their incentives, what are they trying to accomplish, and how can we work productively with them together. So you could hear within that, within his comments, some of the pressures that he was facing, some of the things that were top of mind for the White House and the ways that they're thinking about indoor air quality and its relation to other topics that are very important as well. So that's one of the, the reasons why it's always fascinating to hear folks like that speak. Start, you get some insight into their thinking and their priorities, and then that gets you thinking about how we can work together to accomplish our goals. And also like, what are the, the priorities that they're placing? Yeah. Right. Right. I think it was nice too, to see the medical community um, and, and him kind of as starting it out as tying the medical community to the indoor air quality world. And I, I, I think in the future, that's going to be a big key for us to get the kind of traction we want. You mentioned Joe Allen. Let's play that second clip, John. Dr. Allen will be with us, by the way, November 18. We challenged ourselves this summer with a simple question. What set of actions, if every building took right now, would really move the needle quickly? We released a report called the first four healthy building strategies that every building should pursue. Number one, give your building a tune-up. We do this for our cars. We don't do it for our buildings. It improves indoor air quality and saves money. Two, maximize outdoor air ventilation. Three, upgrade filtration. We need to move away from filters designed to protect equipment to fil filters designed to protect people. MERV 13 is the new minimum. And we can supplement this with portable air cleaners. This is not the end all list, but this is where you should start. I think he did a nice job there kind of boiling it down to those four key points they kept coming back to time after time. Mark? Yeah, he is a passionate speaker. And I was looking at some of my own notes. Uh, yeah, he, he said, you know, the, the person who manages your indoor air has a greater impact on your health than your doctor. I think that might be an exact quote. And I was like, oh, wow, you know, I, I totally get that. But that's not something that I had thought about before. I was like, like he, he just does a great job of surfacing these connections, bringing these insights so I, I, his, so his energy, his passion, uh, and the way that he connects the issues, uh, I thought was just fantastic. So I, I, I look forward to when you have him on. I'll definitely be tuning into that episode. And next, I want to play. Uh, this is the only one we got two quotes from Dr. Allen one more time because I think he did a nice job of setting up what was a, a recurring theme throughout the event, John. I think we need to take the pulse of our buildings regularly. When you go to a doctor, what's the first thing she does? Takes your pulse, takes your blood pressure, basic indicators of human physiology and function. We need to do the same for our buildings. We can take the pulse of our buildings using lower cost indoor air quality sensors, sensors that measure things like CO2, a proxy for ventilation rate. Indoor air quality monitoring should become the norm in every building, much like we measure temperature. Seeing an IAQ monitor on the wall should become as normal as seeing a thermostat. That was repeated over and over, Mark. Yes, yeah, so, but that got me thinking, right? So this is where I start to have like a little bit of technical knowledge, but then I'm quickly out of my depth. So <laughs> I, like, because I, I, mean, I was like, oh, wow, that sounds great. Like have an IQ monitor, but then I was like, all right, so what does good, quote unquote, indoor air mean? What are the components of good air? What are the action levels? And then I'm like, turn it right back to you all. Like that's, I feel like aside from ventilation rates and CO2 as a proxy, I'm not sure that we currently have a really good understanding, but I, that, that's a question if you don't mind, I ask to you all, do we right now have a good idea of what the components of quote unquote good IQ are. Uh, yes and no. I think later in the uh, event, Lindsay Marr addressed that. And, and I don't know so much in the U.S. as we that we do, but definitely I think the World Health Organization is making great strides in that area. And it's just a matter of 
getting everybody together and on the same page. And just like, you know, Joe Allen had those four pillars, tune up your building, which I know Ed Light had to love. Number one pillar, tune it up, fix what's already there and get it working the way it was supposed to work in the first place. That's been something we've been pounding on. Um, ventilate your building, proper filtration, and then supplement that with things like air cleaners. I think we need to do the same simple things with respect to what is good indoor air quality and, and give people metrics that they can measure and then either, you know, reach or not reach and, and then put a scorecard up. So, yeah, that uh, makes sense. Cause you got to imagine that people want a dashboard, you know, like they want, they just, they just want like the, the building occupants for the most part are going to be non-technical and maybe they want a score or maybe they just want a simple, red light, green light, yellow light, or maybe even just a more binary red light, green light system. And and uh, in, in, in maybe they even want, like an, I think that Boston City Schools has done this, even put a, a dashboard online that folks can access and say, here's the current status of uh, each school building, for instance. And, and then what do you do when you don't have good air quality, when it's in the red, so to speak? then do you, do you open a window? Well, that presupposes that you can open the window, which introduces potential safety concerns. It also has an intersect with, uh, it assumes that there is good outdoor there and that, that there is good uh, outdoor available, uh, outdoor air available. And then it also assumes that that window is in a position that's like not near an exhaust. And so there's all of these confounding, complicating, factors that of course make IAQ a super fascinating issue and it has so many connections and impacts but at the end of the day it is clear that we have to do more so I guess that that's a another thing that like his comments make me think that what are the metrics that we have to know that there's not good IAQ is it that we're going in a building or a school, or uh, is it that we're going to put sensors in various places? Are we using the age of a building as a surrogate? Is it the configuration of a building? Is it, what is it? Like, what are the metrics that we're using to define these, these summary conclusions or these episodic uh, uh, indicators of good or not so good air quality? So it's, uh, on the one hand, it's like, yeah, like, it seems really simple. But on the other hand, it seems like it's quite complex. And then especially the thoughts that I have in government relations are, what are the policy levers that we're trying to use? What's the really behavior that we're trying to change? And like, what's the specific objective? And then that gets even more complicated because it's very context specific. And then I don't wanna, uh, jump ahead in case you were thinking about uh, going in this direction, but there's so many, it's all very local context pers uh, specific, might be disaster, sustainability, all that stuff. So there's all different kinds of ways that you can connect IAQ and all these other factors that impact air quality. And, and, and so that's where I'm like, oh, wow, so many interesting directions that you can go in. There so, are. I, I, there's a couple great comments here. I'll get to those in a moment. Before we do that, I, I want to finish on this school thing for a moment because there was a, a very impressive, I believe he was the superintendent of Clark County Schools, uh, Jesus Yara, Jara, I believe it is. Uh, John, let's go to that clip. I thought he really tied some, some things together very nicely. There is a lot of research and evidence as of the last three years in particular that academic performance is tied to building performance. And I've learned that throughout the last couple of years, which is tied to health performance. So that's the tripod, academic, building, and health performance. Um, and if that's going to be the minimum expectation, I'm asking respectfully, allow us to say that this is a non-negotiable, whether it's through some uh, continual uh, funding or through policy. Um, and as uh, Dr. Ja, you mentioned when you opened up, we won't question water quality, right? If we open up a tap and we see you know, something that looks less than translucent and it's brown, you no, know, we'll go into action or we'll close the school. No if, ands, or buts about it. It's like a gas leak. We don't know if that's the case when it comes to air quality. We'll walk into a room un unbeknownst to what we're walking into. So if we have the monitoring systems, which we've invested 
uh, in our school system and in our buildings, and we know when things are less than satisfactory or adequate, then we can close down and mitigate. Um, if that's the expectation, let it be the expectation, because we will never allow a glass of water to be less than uh, pristine. I like that comparison. I also want to go back to Paul Schenck had a comment here. Um, what isn't understood so well generally, what metrics actually relate to health? And I think that goes back to several of the, the theme throughout. Um, Mark, thoughts on that? Yeah, so that's a... That's the con one of the confounding factors is human biology is so complex that what is it that uh, is causing an ill health effect? And then, of course, there might be a lag. And there, uh, so what it, was it in the built environment? Was it something in a particular built environment? Was it in a residence? rather than a school or other type of facility that caused that. So, you know, causation is very difficult to, to prove. And so maybe you don't focus so much on trying to prove that. Maybe you instead look to the experts, look to some of the consensus standards, you look to professional judgment and you say, well, we know, well, we can't maybe pinpoint this particular malady, ill health effect. We can't, we do know that if you improve the systems, if you modernize buildings, if you educate people, if you put in sensors, and yeah, we don't have all the information right now, but we maybe have enough or close enough that we can start making some meaningful decisions to improve people's health. Maybe that's the direction that you go in. So that's where it, it becomes super important to be really humble and clear about what you know and what is still unknown and, and yet still having the confidence to move forward amidst uncertainty because we can't let our uncertainty and lack of absolute knowledge prevent us from taking action. We, and that's maybe one of the dangers of the moment is that it is so complex and we don't have as much information that we would like that we don't want, while technical discussions are of course important and should always, always continue. Expertise should always continue to refine itself. We always want to make that progress. It's, we need to, there, there, we have enough right now where we can continue to take action right now. So that's where, uh, so that's what we do. There's like two streams. There's the professional knowledge uh, development stream and then there's the, what can we do with what we have now to make progress and improve people, the learning and working conditions of people throughout the country and the world. And, you know, you don't want to oversimplify this either, because just because you have um, within a certain metric of particulate in your building, for instance, it's, it's, it's also important to know what components of particulate are within that level. I mean, and so it's not as easy sometimes as people like to make it out to be. And then you have to worry, you have to consider, okay, what are the people experiencing? What what are they experiencing? How do we get that feedback to help us with improving the indoor air quality? And I think that's, that's a component of this that was, it was touched on a little bit, but I think we have to go into a little more on that. I got one more before we, before we break for halftime, John, let's go to clip five with uh, Tracy Anger. You heard Dr. John this morning talking about the, the moment that we're in and Dr. Allen talking about how it is becoming a movement. And it absolutely is. COVID has brought us this moment. And because of the actions of school districts like you see before you right now, it has become a movement towards indoor air quality. But we have this opportunity right now to take this moment that is becoming a movement and turn it into a monument for environmental health and improved uh, indoor air quality, improved health for students and staff in our country forever and ever. Amen. I, I, you know, she has a way of putting things that, that is quite interesting and it kind of gets to the point, Mark. Yeah, it definitely does. Uh, she is an enchanting speaker and, and I always love hearing uh, her you know, present and, so, uh, yeah, I totally agree that we, we got to be careful that we treat this, this moment that we're in carefully and that we nurture it. And, and so, yeah, I, I definitely uh, agree with everything 
that she said, there's so many different factors that come into play here. I guess that what it, a lot of it, what it comes down to is taking the time to learn about each other and our stakeholders. And so rather than coming in and saying, this is what you should do, this is the right way, it's super important to understand the stakeholders involved, to understand their points of view, to understand what they care about, to understand what motivates them, to understand their concerns, their pain points, their frustrations, and to get alignment and consensus, however defined, on problem and solution, to understand the local context in which these decisions and even the challenges and abilities of folks at the White House that everybody has strengths and limitations, freedoms. And, and so how can we, so let's take a, a moment and be, and be careful and learn about each other. And so that's the approach that we're absolutely taking uh, with AIHK's involvement in this space. We have a renewed focus on in, encouraging our members to get out into and so we're focusing on elementary and secondary schools we're focusing on institutions of higher education we're focusing on libraries and off-campus student housing we are relatively early in this renewed focus but it emanates from builds on our work with COVID-19 and and then some of the focus from the White House and then a number of other factors so I had a conversation with Tracy during the break and afterwards. And so we're, we're gonna meet up and have a conversation. Well, what comes next? She's over at EPA. EPA has got some interesting things going on. The White House has some interesting things going on. There's a lot of federal agencies and a lot of government levels that are involved in this. How can we understand each other and solution? that kind of thing, make progress. When we have alignment between problem and solution, that's when progress is rapidly made. Well said, Mark. Let's go to halftime. We'll be back with Mark Ames, the AIHA's government relations uh, group here. Our marquee sponsor is First On Site, your trusted full service disaster recovery and property restoration company at firstonsite.com. Our association sponsors are ACGIH, Advancing Careers of Professionals in Environmental Health, Industrial Hygiene, and Safety, Interested in Defining Their Science, ACGIH.org, AIHA, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World, AIHA.org, The Cleaning Industry Research Institute, See More Deeply Through Science and Research, CIRI science.org. The IICRC, a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry, IICRC.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories, free shipping, great pricing, same day results with no rush fee, AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus, Feature rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation. Count on us, particlesplus.com. TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations, TSI.com. Sunbelt Rentals, availability, reliability, and ease for all your IAQ and restoration needs at sunbeltrentals.com. April Air, healthy air, healthy home, April, A-I-R-E dot com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online magazine for industry professionals and consumers, healthyindoors.com. All right, we're back for the second half with Mark Games. John, let's jump right into clip number six. Kevin Campshower from the GSA, Government Services Administration, the biggest landlord maybe in the world. Age of buildings and the different configurations of buildings, probably the, our, our biggest significant challenge. Um, and the, that's coupled with, you know, well-documented and not just by Dr. Allen, but by a number of other people, the, the findings that 
If you think your building is operating the way it's designed to operate, it's not. The chances is, are very, very slim. So that opens up also an opportunity. I mean, you have to look very carefully at what you can do. We have about, I want to say, tw some between 20 and 25 percent of our buildings are so old and uh, the systems designed in such a way we cannot physically put a MERV 13 filter in. So then what do you do if you can't do that? And how do you change things around? And um, one of the things that uh, uh, we dealt with, for example, is I, I work in a building over here. When we renovated it, we made the building work the way it was originally intended, namely in a city where 170 days out of the year, all you have to do to heat, cool the building is open the windows. We made the building windows operable. And I, I read a little announcement once saying, we're going to seal up all the building windows to prevent COVID. And it's like, no, that's, you don't have any basis for that. So, so education, um, we find that building managers definitely want to do the right thing, but they don't know what the right thing is. So getting the information out there, we worked on a tool. I'm going to be talking to my colleague to the left here about his tool as well, because I'm very interested in that. But we've, we've got a lot of information that links you to CDC guidance, the, the uh, reports from the Harvard School of Public Health, any number of other places, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, Pacific Northwest National Lab, all kinds of people who are there. It's called SF Tool. And if you do SF Tool and just search for COVID, you get COVID specific guidance. And you can also look for green cleaning products that will prevent people from getting sick and prevent your employees who are cleaning the building from getting sick from the materials they're doing, using. Um, so the, the education component, I think, is the biggest single long-term uh, difficult thing. We can deal with the physical aspects of the building. You identify it, you fix it, and you move on. People change, people move jobs, and, and we really need to be extraordinarily vigilant about making sure that education doesn't drop away as, as we become used to the way we're dealing with COVID today and used to the next one that's coming around because that, that kind of complacency is what's going to lead to the next you know, mass exodus from buildings and we don't need that. I thought that was another theme that kept coming up, education and training. You know, uh, Later on, we'll talk about UV light and it's all great and UV light may work really well, but who's going to design the UV light? Who's going to install the UV light? Who's going to maintain the UV light? Those are the kind of things that uh, we've got to start thinking about now. And I noticed that um, Dawn had a Dawn Weeks had a comment here to ask Mark about the US EPA's request for information on better indoor air quality management to help reduce COVID and other transmission. And, and Mark, I noticed you put up the link to that. So we have to not only educate the people that we work with, but we've got to educate the government on what we need. Yeah, absolutely. And it was so great to see Kevin again in person. I worked with him particularly closely when I was at ASHRAE. We walked into the Eisenhower Executive Office building uh, together, which is where the summit was held. By the way, if folks aren't familiar, when, whenever, like almost always when someone says they're going to the White House, they're usually, unless they're meeting with like the president, they're almost always meeting in the Eisenhower Executive Office building, which is right next to the White House. And that's where the summit was held. A beautiful building. I put up some pictures uh, on my LinkedIn page if you want to check it out. Uh, and so, yeah, that's one of the, the biggest uh, take home messages that from this whole summit that uh, that I, I agree with that Kevin said that the importance of education goes to that consensus bit that I mentioned earlier, getting consensus about the problems, getting consensus about solutions and keeping in mind that it's context and a specific and hyper local uh, keyed to uh, person and community's interests, whether it's sustainability, high performance green buildings, reducing absentee rates, uh, absenteeism rates, whether it's uh, resiliency, disaster preparedness, response, recovery, education, awareness, super, super important. And in that, because uh, it's not like, like, because there's like three issues, one or three levels of issues. One is that not everyone's aware that IAQ is a problem. 
Yep. And then the folks who are aware that maybe it's a problem, that they, they're not sure what to do. And they're, uh, and then, so they don't have the technical expertise. And then even like, so there's, there's the problem, uh, raising awareness about the problem. And then, okay, I want to take action. What do I do? And then who do I go to for those solutions? And that's one of the places that AIHA members and other technical experts, engineers, et cetera, can really play a starring role helping whether it's a school leader a district leader or a building manager etc make those decisions oh, on which technologies to implement all of that type of work which solutions are appropriate given what they're what they want to do what their goals are what their budgetary constraints are and even the different funding mechanisms that are available not everyone's aware of all the different federal funding that might be available or right. other types of public private partnerships different mechanisms for financing so it, it's a lot of, it's a lot for anyone to digest and take in but that type of knowledge is another place where we're really strong we can help out yeah, I think AIHA and ASHRAE, both you know groups that you've worked a lot with, uh, have done a great job on education. ACGIH, all of these groups are trying to get materials together, and 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 it was because of COVID. All of a sudden, I mean, it, it's not that they weren't before COVID; they were, but it really accelerated during COVID. So it kind of goes back to what Tracy Anger said that that we need, you know, we have this moment. Um, we have some momentum going now we need to really make a monument and um, make sure that indoor air quality is something that everyone thinks about all the time you spend 90 percent of your time indoor air indoors uh, you've got to start thinking about like water quality indoor air quality john let's go to the next one this is going to be guy Vardy from Silverstein Properties, large landlords, class five buildings um, all through New York and other areas. Very interesting gentleman. It's a landlord. We are not in the real estate business. We are in the productivity and engagement of employee business. Um, we are as successful as our company, as our uh, customer, and our customer are going to be success, successful if their uh, employees are going to be productive and engaged. And <laughs> air ventilation has an uh, impact on three areas. A, health is uh, important. And, and safety. The second one is sick days. Um, one of the first tenants that moved to the World Trade Center 15 years ago moved from a really old building that was later demolished. And they report 30% uh, reduction in, uh, in sick days. It goes back to health again, Mark. That health yeah. component is so important. Yeah, what's going to motivate folks to action? Maybe it's a reduction in sick days. There are studies that show that cognitive performance increases when you have reduced CO2 and VOCs in a space. So productivity, performance, health, well-being, comfort, they're all impacted by IAQ and a lot of folks just don't realize. So raising up these issues, one of the purposes of this White House IAQ summit, uh, that and then getting and then focusing attention all right so what do we do is it, is it going to be standards does everyone need to do retro commissioning recommissioning or do we need to demolish old buildings build new buildings what this, do we need to install sensors everywhere do we need what do we need to do what's the solution what what's the solution or what's the set of solutions we heard some of those we heard some pillars today but we need to get more of that out we need to educate many many folks all throughout the nation it's a big country that we have about really what is. are the problems and what are the solutions how do you solve it and then who do you go to when you're ready to take action and how do you measure the payback right uh, I, yeah. I think you know i i've got a very conservative friend who just texted me privately you know i can see him going crazy about well we're going to spend all this money well you know sometimes you spend money to save money um and and businesses and the government the largest real estate owner in the world may be the gsa um they're really being proactive from what i understand it and they are kind of the um they are the place where a lot of the experimentation gets done that was brought up in in the in the conference where you know, GSA, um, like underfloor ventilation, uh, underfloor, um, 
the mechanical systems that come up from below. And then, you know, that stuff was done at GSA first, and, and they can be a place where we can experiment on a lot of these things and try and get it right. Let me go on to the next one. This is uh, Dr. Shelley Miller, who's been a, a friend of the show. We've had on the show a few times. I thought uh, this last group, Shelley Miller, Rich Corsi, and others brought up some great points. I think that um, as far as needs for um, implementing some of these solutions that we already know work, but we're just not using them effectively, we need a lot of infrastructure around training. Uh, we need installers, we need training, we need operators. So for example, if you decide that you want to install a germicidal UV system in your facility, in your space, that's really good sense because there's a lot of respiratory diseases that we face every day. Think about childcare centers when we always have kiddos coming home and bringing diseases home to their families. I think germicidal UV could be very effective uh, against a lot of um, a lot of things we face every day, not just the COVID-19. We were looking at germicidal UV way back in the 2000s for our outbreak of tuberculosis. We continue to see that it's effective for measles. Uh, we were Don Milton and I were wanting to study it for flu outbreaks. So why can't we put a little bit more emphasis on on these kinds of technologies? But we don't have the people to design it. Uh, King County, Seattle had to call me and I said, I'm not a designer, I'm a researcher. I couldn't tell you what systems you need, but I will tell you who to call, of which again, there's not that many experts. We need, you know, we need in, um, investments in the infrastructure, the training, the, the maintenance, the personnel, like how, but we have to get it in um, places that we know are trustworthy and, and can do good work. We've seen problems in South Africa with bad lamps, with lamps that don't work. And so it can happen and we know fraud and all of these kinds of things can happen. So a good investment could really take us a long way towards investing in the technology we know exists, which is 254, and the new technology, which we're doing lots of research on is 222. Mark, your thoughts? Yeah, there's a lot of solutions. There's a lot of potential solutions and that's another one of the challenges. Which solution or which set of solutions do you choose? And there are even some folks who maybe you're trying to sell something that's not a great solution. Maybe they're trying to sell a technology that's not proven. I'm not saying that's the case for UV or anything, but that's and this stuff gets really technical, right? So you can have someone who is a slick talker who approaches someone and says, hey, I'm going to make your IEQ better. And they, and then they sell an expensive product to someone. And is that really going to solve their problem or will it create additional problems? That type of awareness is another type of education, kind of myth busting that uh, folks with AIHA and the surrounding community also uh, play a role in doing is educating, not just raising awareness about an issue, but here are some things to watch for here. Here's like a buyer's guide. Here's what to consider when uh, selecting a solution. So the, so that's uh, that's the direction that her talk got me thinking that there's some really interesting technology solutions out there. And that's another I could imagine that if you're having to select uh, the solutions for your building, if you're trying to select a contractor, like where do you go? AIHA can definitely help with that, other organizations as well. But I could just imagine, especially if you have a larger building, that it can be pretty complicated and, uh, and very intimidating. Overwhelming at times. Let's go to the next one, John. This is Rich Corsi. I think. I've got two left, this one and then the kind of summarizing one from my perspective anyway, but let's listen to what Dr. Corsi has to say, another great friend of the show. The first thing I'd like to say is that relative to other fields, the indoor air quality fields, research for indoor air quality, uh, research opportunities and funding has been anemic in our country historically. Um, 
we are where we are right now with outdoor air quality, which is dramatic improvements, even though we still have some work to go, um, because of the Clean Air Act, 50-year-old Clean Air Act. And initially, with that Clean Air Act, there was a lot of debate as to what the standards should be. And an initial condition was, just, was, was put forth. Um, the standards for outdoor air quality today look nothing like they did 50 years ago. They've evolved tremendously, and the reason they've evolved, they've evolved is because a whole lot of research that has led that evolution over 50 years, 50 years, right? So I don't think we're going to solve indoor air quality problems overnight. It's taken 50 years to get to where we are with outdoor air quality. But I think we need something akin to the Clean Air Act for indoor air quality. Um, in the year 2000, 22 years ago, I wrote an article um, that was a call to action and said that we needed an, we needed new Clean Air Act amendments that dealt with indoor air quality. That was 22 years ago and tried to lay out the importance of indoor air quality, all the things we're talking about today, 22 years ago. Imagine had we started 22 years ago where we would be today. We'd be almost halfway to where we've gotten with the outdoor, you know, the Clean Air Act. So, so what I'd like to see is something like, doesn't have to be called this, but something like a Clean Indoor Air Act. Well, he said it would be, uh, I don't know if he said controversial, but something like that. And he was going to kind of stir the pot a little bit. What did you think, Mark? Yeah, I think it's an interesting idea that, so what are the unmet needs? And what do we need to accelerate progress? This is where I look to guidance for, uh, from you. I look for guidance for, from you and other AIHA members and other stakeholders. What's the what's the gap? Where do we want to be, and where and what does it take together? I feel like I probably have a vision of where of the type of, of the type type of world and community that I would like to live in. What what a modernized building looks and feels like, but what does it take to get there? And how can we accelerate progress? What's the research agenda for IAQ? What are the unmet needs? And how can the federal government, which is a huge uh, uh, funder of research, how can it be a partner? So that type of information is key in the conversations that I'm looking forward to having with AIJ members and many others that the better under the, when we can understand even more finally what's needed, then we can communicate that to the folks in Congress and the agencies, et cetera. And then again, that consensus on problem, goal, direction, and solution, then that we can make progress towards those goals. But having a common vision in mind and the obstacles that stand in the way, key stuff. That's where I spend a good part of my work is that consensus building and thinking through that from a kind of strategic level, thinking about all the possible consequences intended and otherwise that might come out of possible directions that we could go in, trying to keep that, those various links and components in mind. Great comment. I, I It kind of made me think uh, something I hadn't thought before, but we need to get our own act in order before we can tell the government what to do and how to do it, or, or at least make knowledgeable recommendations for what to do and how to do it. I like that. You know, you want uh, you want debate among professionals. That's uh, appropriate, but and should be encouraged. On the other hand, at some point, you need to take some action. And, and so when do you have enough information to say, yeah, this is a direction that we want to go in? Uh, you know, continuous learning and progress. It's... Um, you know, look, the, the struggle towards progress is something that we should embrace, and, and that's a, also something that we should always be clearly communicating. It's okay when we don't have all of the answers, when we don't know everything. It's okay to tell that to people and to be honest about where we're at. It helps. Well said. Let's go to the roundup, John. The Roundup is brought to you by April Air, providing healthy humidity, ventilation, and air purity solutions for new and existing homes. April Air, healthy air, healthy home at aprilaire.com. 
All right, let me get it over to the Z-Man real quick. Uh, Cliff, you didn't get a chance to jump in. I wonder if you have any thoughts, comments, or questions for Mark. I don't know where to start, Joe. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I'll just uh, hand it back off to you. All right. Well, let, let me let me do this. I've got one more clip that kind of I thought the one missing thing from the event was, and it happens regularly at these events. Uh, lots of you know input from the research area. By the way, we didn't mention there was also a panel on how to help um, not just low income, but, you know, handicapped people, et cetera, who also, you know, um, immune compromised people. And, and they did a nice job in that arena as well. It's something that we always have to keep in mind. But I thought the one area that was underrepresented was the indoor air quality community. Why wasn't Mark Ames from AIHA regulatory affairs on one of those panels or, or, or those from, you know, somebody from ASHRAE that, or better yet, how about somebody like, uh, I'll say Bob Krell, who um, does healthy indoors, and he also gets his hands dirty going out and cleaning mechanical systems at the Government Service Administration buildings in, in D.C. Um, I don't think there was enough input from those kind of people, but that's kind of uh, pretty common in my uh in my experience with a lot of these events. But let's play that last clip because there was one gentleman who was Scott Frank at Jaros Bomb and Bulls. I believe he's a mechanical engineer. Let's listen to what he had to say. The point about um, awareness and raising awareness, it's made been made several times today, and as it should. And of course, what's implicit in the value of increased awareness is change in behavior. And uh, Dr. Miller just mentioned a, a consumer choice preference uh, decision difference that might come from greater awareness, but it applies to all other context of the built environment as well. For instance, a step that we should be taking is people like us should be walking around with one of these, a portable indoor quality monitor. How many, how many of those are in the room here? I see several. Okay. <laughs> you know, and we see that uh, the uh, CO2 concentration in this room is hovering around uh, 1,200, 11, 13, you know, which isn't great. It's, it's consistent with the legacy standards of our industry, as Dr. Allen pointed out, the ASHRAE standard, but it's certainly subpar about where we need to go. So all of us um, asking those questions of the providers of the built environment that we consume is essential. And I say that because in my observation many years on the private sector in this industry, I've observed that the real estate industry is as a free market is quite efficient. And, and it does match supply to demand um, quite readily. And so if the users, people like us, are asking questions and requiring more of the built environment, the industry is able to respond. And I believe it will. So I'm optimistic about this to the theme of if we are successful in, uh, in raising awareness. The, the see something, do something mantra that we all live with now, post 9-11, we need the equivalent for this moment in time, which as we have also discussed, won't last forever. Mark, final yeah, thoughts. Well, Community level awareness, right? So this is a White House summit, but ultimately this change is going to occur at the individual level. It's going to, it emphasizes the importance of reaching out to communities, of raising awareness, of helping people understand why IEQ matters. And so again, it's going to be a grassroots thing. Like the change that we see isn't going to be driven by the White House. Yeah, they did a great job raising the profile of this issue. I'm glad that they had it. And I do thank the White House for, for hosting this event. And I look forward to working with them to advance our common goals. Uh, but this is going to be something that the change we see will always be at the local level. It will be driven by the people on the ground. It will be driven by our members and the other professionals on the ground in communities that's why our greatest strength is our volunteers. It's our communities. It's a network. When you look, what's the greatest value that people often ascribe to joining AIHA? It's the networking. It's the people. So it's influencing people. It's having conversations and, and with people that you don't know. 
And that's another area that AIHA, that I can absolutely help with. How do you have these conversations with various people in the community, with stakeholders, with the general public on the importance of IAQ? So that's, uh, so I think that it was a great, great point to end on because uh, th this is going to be driven by folks on the ground for sure. Excellent. Uh, very, very great way to, I think, round this up and finish it off. Before we go, Mark, any final thoughts, anything we missed that you definitely wanted to get out today? No, I think just thank you so much for having me on the show. It's been a pleasure, a fascinating discussion. So thank you. Well, thank you, Mark Ames, for joining us today on IAQ Radio Plus. I think uh, I'm pretty happy with how that one came out, John. We're, we're, we, I think we we pulled it together. It was quite a project, but we pulled it together. I want to thank our host, our, our guest, my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. John, you got to have faith that the controls, most importantly, are loyal audience and sponsors uh we'll be doing a flashback next week but we put a great lineup coming up in two weeks from now that uh, you're going to see four or five great shows in a row here going right into the holidays so please come back and join us next friday at noon for the next episode of iaq radio plus for iaq radio i'm spike real saying thanks for listening 